like to start with you, Jeroen. You've explained this, this many times before, um, but what I would like to know is how did the idea of responsible innovation come across? When did it start? When, it, when did this new idea show up? Um, well, we have to go way back. I try to describe um, the process a little bit in the uh, introductory to the first um, volume of the proceedings of this coming out of this conference. And actually, I'm looking at, uh, at Jose van Eindhoven of uh, Rathenau and, um, and uh, now Erasmus University. And we were in a, in a group, and, and this goes way back uh, 2006. And we were thinking about how to, 2003 even, yeah. Yeah, it started, yeah. Um, <clears throat> We were thinking about um, a very relevant program for the Dutch Research Council, kind of societally relevant, addressing the problems of our times. And we said it, 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 it is bound to have something to do with technology. And um, so we agreed on that, both of us did. And uh, so we were thinking we had an ethics and policy program at that time. We said we, it needs to be explicitly geared towards the, the high technology challenges and, and all the social implications that will come with it. Um, and then we had Ari Rip uh, also there, and uh, we started to think about how we could weld all of those different communities together. Uh, and then we thought, of, you know, uh, I don't know exactly how it came about, but we started to think about, we have MVO, which is in, in Dutch, maatschappelijk verantwoord ondernemen. Um, but we need something that is much closer to the technology, that is very close to the innovations where the rubber hits the, the road. Uh, and, we have to need, and we need to be there early on in the process. And um, so we have to relate to those communities, the, to the engineers, to the applied scientists, so that we can talk to them. Um, the moment where they're at the, the drawing board and they're thinking about their technologies and, and, and have a, an, a moral and societal conversation with them to make them aware but also to draw their attention to and, and elicitate some of their creativity to think about how we can address, and this is a very important notion, uh, uh, address the grand challenges of our time, how we can use technology to solve and to help solve those, some of those problems. And make it a moral issue. Cause that's and make it a moral, i a moral issue, yeah. Because I, I think that's part of the revolution, because designers always try to improve things. That's yes. what they do. Yeah. But they don't necessarily turn it into a moral yeah. obligation yeah. of any kind. Yeah. And of course, it's a moot point because, you know, what is the moral truth? And it you know, is, a, is a can of worms that we're opening. But we find ourselves uh, in our boat at sea and we need to repair our boat at sea. So we have to start somewhere. And there are so many of those uh, moral and societal obligations, whether there is about sustainability or about uh, safety and security or about privacy, they're all important. And so we've referred to that as uh, we, we, we feel overburdened and, o and overpowered by all those moral and societal obligations. And this is exactly the point, because that triggers, that's not a problem, that may trigger creativity and innovation, because now we suddenly we find ourselves in this dire moral situation, this predicament, and we need to innovate ourselves out of the problem. There's no guarantee that there will always be this kind of silver bullet, bullet solution to those problems. But um, it's relative to, to the stakes, and if the stakes are high, we have an obligation to try and to see whether there is that silver bullet. And, and so some, some really uh, intriguing uh, solutions have been, uh, have been and I've mentioned some of the, in, in the introduction, you know, the Dutch Fairphone or the, and, and, and so the structure of those, uh, those solutions is, is that they are a solution in one fell swoop for a number of those uh, uh, moral and societal obligations that, are, that, we, that we're confronted with. Right? And it often starts with a clash. That's what someone said yesterday in the uh, closing debate, that if there's a clash of interest, if there's a, a conflict, that's where the innovation usually starts. Yes. Yeah. Which is an interesting line of thinking. Yeah, because it's always seen as you know, there's the you know, there are the, the people who are raised those societal and ethical uh, issues, and oh, that's a problem. Yeah, but it's it is a problem. But it's also at the same time a trigger uh, to actually to to uh, to press us more hard on, on those problems and to and to um, uh, make us work harder on, on solutions. And I think we can say that it's that it's booming. That the idea is taking off. That it's you 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 hear it more often. Yeah. It's it's become uh, accepted and even propagated by politicians. There's there's money, which is important. Yeah. Um, 
so, so it's gaining ground, the idea of responsible uh, innovation. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I think that um, since the European uh, Commission has taken this up in 2012, um, it's really spread and it, it helps that you know, there's 500 million approximately available in, over the course of 10, uh, 10 years uh, for this type of research. Um, so, and it, it's a meeting place, as you see at this conference, you know, people from different research communities come together and they find here a common ground to discuss uh, the problems that they're all concerned with. Um, but certainly the money helps uh, and it also helps to mainstream it and, and, um, and it becomes, of course we have seen the Lund Declaration, uh, Sweden, uh, that already said, you know, our applied science and R&D in Europe should be geared towards the grand challenges and now we had uh, the Rome Declaration which actually confirmed that cons and, and consolidated that, um, that idea in Europe. Um, and I hope that, uh, that other countries, of course, including the Netherlands, uh, will, will uh, join forces and will make statements to the same effect. A couple of years ago, the word was sustainability. And um, there came a time when everybody was sustainable. Even the, the, the bakery on the corner was sustainable. The, the mail delivery was sustainable. My phone company was sustainable. And at the, at the end of it, this sustainable thing it didn't mean anything anymore. It had become a hollow phrase because everybody was using it. I think that's a risk for, maybe a risk for responsible innovation as well. How do you keep that from becoming a hollow phrase that is too often used? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. I think that is that is a, a threat. Um, therefore, the um, you know the, the metrics, the assessment tools that some of the projects now also in the European context are working on um, to operationalize this this wonderful notion um, uh, to come up with models and tools is very important. Uh, and probably w we should also be looking at some standardization and some inclusion or incorporation in, into st standards like ISO or something like that. Because it's, it cannot be the case that you just use these words, wonderful words, and, and uh, reap the benefits of that without uh, pulling your weight. And so that's, um, of course, I mean, it may become vacuous or gratuitous, but still you're open, more open than where you're not using the word responsible or sustainable to criticism because you've put it on the table and companies, corporations have also experienced this in, over the course of the last decades. They started to talk about corporate social responsibility and then when you put that on the table, you are open to criticisms of critical journalists to say, well, actually, this is what you're claiming. Are you actually doing this? You're claiming that you're, you, you, you uh, are interested in, in corporate social responsibility, actually show me how you do it in your organization. So you're, you're, you're really vulnerable. So everyone who, and this applies also mutatis mutandis to this, to this case, when you t start to talk about responsibility, then you're open to a certain type of debate or dialogue where you have to be able to follow up on what you've claimed. To put your money where your mouth exactly is. Exactly right. Yeah. Check Wagner. Um, to start off, because you are here with two different functions, I would like to start off with the, the NGO, uh, oh, Nature yeah. and Environment. Before, well, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm making a cliche, which is not always fair, but before there, the environmentalists would say, don't take a plane two times a year, no matter what, just, just go on holiday by bike, or go walking, or maybe use a train, but, but don't take a plane twice a year, why would you? There were others who said, people are gonna take that airplane anyway. We just need to make sure that the airplane gets cleaner. Now, this is a big change for uh, your NGO. When did this change happen? Um, now, first of all, thanks of, of, for being here. Um, I like it very much to be in contact with uh, uh, scientists from social sciences, because you are, that's my first point to you, you are very important for what Jeroen also said are the great challenges of our time. The technicians, and then I'm coming back to your question, the technicians are not able to solve our problems. They need definitely you to get everything at the end of the day implemented and being accepted by everyone. And maybe later on this interview we'll work, we'll work that out a little bit more in detail. But then related to your question, um, the, the role of NGOs in society is, is you have different roles. There are roles of NGOs who would say, what's happening now is completely wrong. We have to say no. Eh? I was uh, happy to see one of the research projects related to uh, scale gas, 
And it's very easy to mobilize people by saying no. But on the other hand, if we want to save this planet or want to do the right things with our planet, we have to say yes to a lot of things. And therefore, our view, and that's another NGO view, that's the view of uh, Natural Milieu and also some other NGOs, is trying to see what do people really need and how can we make the way they want to behave, they want to live, they want to adhere to their own standards of living, how can we make that in a way uh, possible, which is, and then I use this word, sustainable. And you can ask the question, what is then sustainable? If people like to go on holiday, please do it. But if you go then by plane, do it as sustainable as possible. And if it's not possible, for example, with fuels to get it fossil fuel free, then do additional things like uh, do compensational kind of methods, etc. And then I make directly the link to the thing Jeroen is saying, because why are people doing these kind of things? Why do they like to do it? Because somewhere near their heart, there's something saying, this is what is right. And then you can talk discuss about what's exactly right, but then you are touching the element of moral values, what makes them tick. Now, and then I can talk a whole long story, but I think the role of NGOs, uh, in fact, our NGO is, how can we mobilize society to do, to do the right things? Not by using your finger, but by, me, by offering perspectives of dealing and doing different things. You're talking very positively. I think that's part of your strategy, to talk positively, so you're not saying... It's also my heart. But it's, it's not saying what you're doing is wrong. You took an airplane to Spain. What you're doing is saying you did right, but you could do better. That's in 80% of the case or 90% of the case, that's right. Now you're here because uh, you're also part of the um, um, com committee on energy from the, the top sectors. And what you need to do is to make a bridge between science, company and uh, society. And to think of a way to innovate the way we use energy to make it more sustainable. Well, we, we all know the problems that, that are there, um, which is, I think, a very difficult task. So what would you want from uh, the people here? And, and you said the technicians can't solve it, so you probably estimate that these people are not technicians. These people are scientists from the Is that the right software. or not? Well, we have all kinds of people here, but there are philosophers amongst us. There are uh, people with whole different uh, backgrounds. There are some technicians, I think, too. There are experts. But why would you want to be here with these people? What do you want from them? Um, thanks for the question. What I ex especially want from you is now, first of all, um, use your talents. That's in, in basically use your talents um, in a way that it can help to solve the problems of our planet, of our communities. And what I see, and that's I myself also a technician, I, I've studied uh, applied physics. Um, but what I realize in this top sector energy is that there are a lot of very clever guys doing all kinds of interesting research. But at the, end of, at the end of the day, they are not dealing with the question how can we get it accepted? How can we make it a business case that people really like and adapt it? And what I like from you in all kinds of different things is, please align to different scientists with different uh, disciplines because you all have to work together to get the real innovations which are needed for our society. And everyone can do it on his own place, can make the steps which are necessary, but please open the doors and go to people who are thinking and acting completely different. Try to understand them, make bridges, because that's, I think, one of the only ways that they also would listen to your insights and your ways why you should innovate and do the things better. You could also say that's not the, that's, that's not the point of science. That's not what they are for. They're just there to find the truth. And that is uh, our holy mission and changing the planet. That's your, that's your job. And, and what's your question? Well, the question <laughs> is, is that something you should ask of scientists to, to, to change the problems of our time, to, to find a way to business, find a way to society? Should scientists be activists? Should, should they oh, not, not at all. Uh, be uh, entrepreneurs? No, my, I would ask the question to everyone. And I would ask everyone in different roles, also the baker on the, on the street corner, what he or she is trying to contribute 
to the developments which are needed in our society. And if I'm now talking here with a scientist, I'm trying to understand what's your role, where are your talents, and how can you use these talents to bridge to other things to make them much more fruitful for societal developments. Ja, om te maken het een beetje meer concreet. Mijn naam is Vincent Blok, Wageningen University. Uh, you are the head of the top sector energy. Can you tell me or tell us what are the specific problems you face where we can contribute to as social scientists? Um, I can mention uh, three uh, kinds of problems. First of all, um, the whole issue in Groningen. If there are new infrastructural developments, if we talk about wind, we talk about that kind of things, how can we adapt it? I visited myself uh, one of the hearings in the east of Groningen, and it's really very, very complicated to get the windmills over there done. And the only thing to solve it is the knowledge you have and the research you have done to understand what's happening with the people there. That's one issue. Now, another issue is probably, you all know, is uh, the smart meter. The smart meter is essential for being more uh, aware of what you're doing with your energy. Give people a perspective how to deal with solar energy, to energy savings. But if the technicians talk about the smart meters, they have a kind of procedure how to get these things behind the door. Is that the way of getting things done? The solution is much more related, and that's in fact your field, uh, the, the, about what's the X factor? How do you get these things behind the door? What are the dissatisfiers? How do you solve them? And what is the natural moment? I'm thinking now of giving more to the science kind. But what are the natural moments of getting it introduced? And if you know, for example, one of the things uh, recently I understand, what is the X factor of getting things behind the door? That's not the man. He's not in charge of decisions. It's the women. So if you don't be aware of the fact that the smart meters get introduced by understanding what are the, the needs and the desires of women, don't get it done. That's a second element. And a third element is, for example, uh, if you talk to businesses, businesses have to have leading roles in their own way of uh, producing uh, stuff. Now, if you have big companies, quite often they behave more, more or less, I can go more, quite rational. But if you talk about the medium size, the SME companies, how do we get these changed? How do we get the, what do you call it in English, the tounders before that? The, 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 what's the tounders? The, yeah, the greenhouse uh, developers or whatever. <laughs> How do you get these moved in these directions? And then you should definitely understand the dynamics in these groups. You should know that there are advisors in this area which are crucial for decision making. Um, you should understand that the women, I don't have a very spell for women, but in this case also the women are the dominant player in changing business. Because if the man tries, for example, not to sell the flowers by the market by directly to a wholesaler, then the women have everywhere a problem if the price for wholesale is lower than the market. And she's the hero at the moment, the price is higher than the market. But the women should play this role. How do you do it? Understanding dynamics. So these are three elements which I think all of you understand why you see how critical it is to use um, uh, um, social and social science humanities. and humanities and more or not? <laughs> okay, so... Can I, can I but d yes. does it make sense? Okay. There, there was one question and then I'll get to your, your oh, point, yeah. uh, please. Yeah, my name is Rob Lebrink, Wageningen, Wageningen University. <coughs> I have a question both for uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Jeroen van der Hoof and uh, Mr. Wagner. And before I come to my question, I have uh, two observations. Uh, Mr. Jeroen van der Hoof, you, um, you said in the beginning that the idea behind responsible innovation and how it emerged, it also came more from a technological uh, perspective. And, um, or at least with technologies in, 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 the, back of, uh, in the back of the mind. Uh, second observation, what I have is, um, and that's to the person in the middle, uh, <laughs> Mr. Wagner. Um, you said that if you take a flight, there can be questions with regard to the technologies of the fuels and to what extent that's sustainable. And then if there is no improvement in that necessary, you can think of to what extent you can compensate. And I think in that sense, responsible innovation can be a very interesting perspective. Because if you compensate uh, for your um, 
CO2, uh, which yeah is emissions when you take the flight. If you compensate, there are trees planted somewhere else, um, or not even the trees are planted somewhere else, but somebody says we're not cutting the trees, and therefore you're compensating. And it makes to me, it raises the question, why do other people somewhere else uh, have to plant trees for an action you do somewhere when you fly from Amsterdam to Berlin? Why do there uh, need to be plants, uh, trees planted in, in the Amazon or in somewhere in Africa? So in that sense, there is also a matter of responsibilities and how that links people from different uh, locations all in the world together. And compensating for your flight then is not a technological innovation, but it's some kind of institutional innovation. And it's also a change of relationships between people yeah, who are totally distant from each other. So I want to come to my question for the both of you. To what extent responsible innovation should then also look at much more um, uh, social innovations or innovations where there is a change of social relationships, a change of institutions where there is no technology in that sense behind it. The example of the Fairphone is not a technological innovation at all. They do the same as all the other companies from a technological perspective but it's more a business model innovation and a process innovation where they are uh, sourcing ethically uh, acceptable um, yeah, sources and inputs. So you mean actually to say you can have innovations that don't involve any kind of technology which are strictly social in a way. It's, it's about relationships between people, between countries, between groups actually. Yeah, and yeah. to what extent responsible yeah. innovation can give interesting insights in yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And uh, I think the whole program, um, I, I hope at least that that's, uh, that's made clear also in the call and, and the projects that we see around, um, uh, clearly also draw attention to these institutional, these um, organizational, uh, the, the business models, the incentive structures. So, I mean, we are all working, I, I, I assume we're working with a very generous conception of what technology is. Technology is not just the device or the component or the, the system, it's the systems of systems and it, it gives the institutional framework or the social context or the way people deal with it um, uh, is part and parcel of, of the object of our analysis and, and, and design. You, you cannot just say, well, you know, I'm designing this component and I leave uh, out of consideration all of the rest. You know, this talking about windmills or about uh, waterworks or um, uh, IT, everything is about systems of systems, more and more so. so and, 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 and so that's a hybrid beast. It's a, it's a beast that it's comprised of social and technical and organizational and economic and psychological elements and that makes it so incredibly interesting. The reason why we started to think about technology is, is that in many social innovations, by the way we can also talk about conceptual innovations or uh, you know mathematical innovations, it's just innovation indicates that we have something surprisingly new uh, a new piece of functionality that we add to the world that wasn't there before, that as a result of our, our creativity we introduce to the world and allows us to do certain things better or differently or, or things to do, uh, that we couldn't do before. That's, that's the whole thing about innovation. Um, but the, the reason why we started to think about technical innovations is that many of those innovations in the 21st century will start or at least have that very tangible uh, material uh, you know, a standard in a standard sense, technological uh, component in it. It will have the the windmill, the cable, the IT, the soft, you know, the computer hardware, etc. And so from there, you, you can you can think about how are we configuring this, and and how how should we um, um, make it in such a way that it has this overall functionality that we desire. And why do we desire that? Because it hopefully gives us some solutions to our grand challenges. And so that's that's what we want. And so time and again we have to see whether actually we're producing, when we put these systems of systems or these socio-technical systems in place, we are actually producing what we hope to get out of it. So that that's my answer to it. Yeah, and to get back to the point of the airplane, in my opinion, we should uh, not compensate for anything, but simply make cleaner airplanes, which can be done. There are some ideas on that level, which will take a lot of time, but for instance, to uh, the, there was a study here in Holland to imitate the bird flight of a swallow 
into a prototype of an airplane and by moving the wings you could reduce the uh, amount of fuel needed by 30% which is uh, which is a huge innovation if it ever sees the, the the light of day that will be a tremendous change and it started not with the plane makers but it started with the bird watchers actually so that's that's a different line of uh, thinking which which i think can be very promising and also shows that you don't have to just be negative about uh, our way of living but you can also improve the question of course being is there enough time because climate change is uh, uh, going very fast you said something uh, about i just want to yeah. say um just to see the analog uh, analogy um 50 60 years ago finance in all kind of enterprises was a kind of staff department because they, they do nice things and at the end of the day they have to count all the beans nowadays it's a member of the board. If you talk about quality, 30, 40 years ago, you have a staff department about quality. You said, okay, that's nice, we should have a little bit of quality. But now we are aware that quality is line business, so it's in the board. If you talk about societal way of uh, innovation or entrepreneurship, in a lot of companies, it's still a staff component and they need it as a kind of uh, license to operate. But at the end of the day, it will develop in a way that is the member of the board. Everything should be integrated. So related to your question about innovation, innovation is not only because we have a positive uh, net, uh, net uh, what is, uh, positive cash flow, the uh, net of content waarde, but we're talking about that the quality is all right. But then you also should ask at the end of the day the question, is this something what society is uh, needed? And then you're not talking about but that's my personal view, not talking about does it uh, have any added value to a certain group in the Netherlands. No, you should talk about the view, what is from a world perspective an added value. And then you are especially raising all the issues you are uh, pointing at. What's the relationship between uh, planting a tree because I'm flying? What are the insights behind it? And then the other way, please be practical and not talk about only studying but also doing the right things. You talked about the difference between uh, the different, different kinds of science. We have a lot of philosophers here, for instance. I studied history and I came across people like you that studied physics and they said, what do you do with history? Is that on the university? <laughs> so there seems to be a distance between the, let's say, hard science and the soft science. How do you get the technicians to listen to the philosophers? How do you get them to feel that they actually need to listen to those other people. Um, you said in the beginning, clash. There has to be a clash of interest. Clash or uh, seduction. That are the two things. Jeroen. Well, <laughs> yeah, <we> clash, <laughs> clash or seduce them. Well. <laughs> yeah, I can make, I can open it a little bit more, but anyway. Huh? <laughs> Jeroen, how do you think that you um, get it? The, the, because you're well, a philosopher working <laughs> at a technical university, so, so you're an expert on this. Yeah. I, I mean, well, the students expert, I don't know, but but uh, I mean, many of you will are t are associated or affiliated with with uh, academia, and and you will have noticed that uh, you don't need to talk for a long time to students to convince them that they, you know, especially applied sciences or engineering or um, um, that they can do a, a great job, that they can help a lot of people, make the world a better place, and you know, I'm putting this. Uh, um, intentionally in these kind of more um, lofty uh, uh, words, because you know people f really feel that students ha have this have this idea that there there are a lot of problems and they can be part of the solution to them. Um, so that's the positive part. Um, and and so for example in Delft, uh, students are queuing up to do um, a third world uh, country uh, or developing uh, technology, a frugal innovation project. So they wanna they wanna go over there and, and, and live there for a time and, 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 and contribute. So there's a positive part. There's also a negative part. There's the clash probably. And this, this is when applied scientists or engineers are, are gung-ho and they want to realize their project and then they bang, they hit the brick wall of what people think, you know, and, and not only the women, but, you know, people have values. They have certain, uh, certain ideas uh, and we need to understand, you know, how they, um, what their opinions are. 
but also how these opinions may change because of the underlying values they have. Because sometimes we may be just confused. You know, when you 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you would ask someone, so what kind of car would you like to drive? Well, SUV would be a, you know, an option. Uh, now that is a, it's a petrol guzzler and, it's, uh, and, and you're, you're ridiculed. You cannot drop off your kids at, 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 uh, at kindergarten with, a, with an SUV. So, uh, so they've changed their, their ideas because, and, and this is a real problem for the social science perspective, and this is the reason why we need applied science, social science, and the humanities, because that helps you to a critical resource of questioning what people actually say when they have to fill out the questionnaire. They say, oh, I want this, I want this. This is something that you may want now. And you say on this page, you say that you want that. And on that page, you say that you want something else. Hey, that's, that seems to be inconsistent. So you need the critical resources to question what the, and that's the economists refer to that as adaptive preferences. We may under the spell, be under the spell of the latest, you know, uh, um, gadgets or, or you know, craze, um, but that, that's not something that is good for the planet or that is good for future generations. So this is the reason why the humanities kick in. And it is exactly the teamwork between the applied science and engineering, um, the social science of understanding of how people deal with it, what they feel about it, how they, how they will use it, um, and these kind of basic values that will serve, you know, things that we have in mind on a very abstract level. and that. The three need to go hand in hand, and that's exactly what these, um, the Responsible Innovation Program uh, is, is enhancing and stimulating by requiring people who submit uh, for, for funding, submit a proposal for funding, require that all the three components need to be there, and they need to be there in a believable way. It's not just, you know, if I gave a phone call to a colleague across campus who is a so happens to be a social scientist or, or, or a philosopher, but these people really need to show that they are working on a solution, and this is the tangible part of it, come up with a design that when introduced will change the world for the better. Now let's make it very practical because you're the head of the uh, top sector of energy. You need to make a bridge between society, science and the companies. You get, uh, probably you got an amount of money to spend on this project. Uh, how much is that? Um, uh, we started with uh, 2.5 million, but the, end, the idea is also that it will be uh, for 30 to 50 percent added with 2.4, 2.5 million from business. So totally 5 million. So there you are, you have uh, this mission, uh, you have five million, what do you do? Who do you call? Uh, where does your day start? Uh, who's the first person you're talking to? Um, how do you spend the money? Uh, how do you get, who is society anyway? Who do you talk to? Um, do we have till seven o'clock or not? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, to make it very practical, um, we started just by doing. So we went to a few businesses uh, we went to some uh, technical person say, what are problems? And come up with uh, some uh, projects. So we started the first year when we have only one million uh, with a few projects. These projects will be judged by uh, uh, top scientists. So it will should be from the right quality. Um, and yeah, a few examples are, for example, uh, no, that makes it a too long story. Uh, but the next step is how we can make it more structural. So we said there are two pillars on our program. Uh, one pillar is uh, do some um, societal research, understand what are the triggers why people should support or resist changes in society. And that could be related to the not in my backyard elements, the elements of a consumer buying things or not buying things, or uh, the uh, me me uh, mid um, uh, medium sized company, why should they behave? No, that's one element, doing just societal research. The other thing is, doing more targeted research projects. And the third element is try to get this knowledge um, discussed with all kinds of technical persons who are doing research, and in this case, seduce them to use the science, I hope not making a mistake, uh, social scientists and humanity scientists, scholars, scholars. Well, scholars um, to work together. And that's, for example, the 1st of October, we will organize a big congress, uh, also with the support of NWO, with NWI programma, um, to have a first, more scientific way of uh, showing results, but also involving people to work together. That are the three pillars. And the first element is, the, th uh, the, 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 the fourth element is, try to get more people involved. So 
I'm, I'm not the head of the top sector energy, but I'm one of the members of the boards. In it. But I try to get all the other top sectors because the problems of, of having in new infrastructure has also to do with chemistry. The chemical has also to do with agriculture. So why not getting the whole innovation element of uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs involved in these kind of things? And in fact, the top sector is focused on from now till five to seven years. But if it's a more longer horizon, I'm looking to Jeroen and the others and see what is MBO doing. So that's also having an alignment on the programs, on the focus, because then we can better work together and see that the elements of the research done by on the MVE program could be also presented to people who are working for innovations on the shorter term notice. And that are the kind of things which I'm, I'm working on. So actually your program gains weight and importance if you get to work along with other groups like this one, for instance. Yeah, especially. And that's, that's yeah, um, I call it a kind of, how do you call it in, in, in English, an olieflek working. And then of course bio oil. Uh, huh? Yeah. So you're hijacking the project a bit for your for your own project and in the end for a better world. So it's, it's Now the word okay. hijacking is not in my vocabulary. What I try to is also seduce and combine and bridge and be a little bit on the background because other people should do it. I'm not in charge of doing it. You're facilitating. Yeah, big, we're facilitating, trying to inspire people to do these steps and building bridges. Does anyone have uh, any questions at this point, please? I have two kinds of questions. When I was listening to you, there's a lot of compensation discourse. So the social sciences come in to convince, to seduce, to compensate. What is their voice? And what would happen if they tell you, we don't want windmills, windmills are maybe not the solution. Um, what would then happen to the energy sector if we would not agree? That's the first question. The second question is, when you were asked what your problem was, you said, Oh, I go and speak to the people from the technology, et cetera, et cetera. And then I go and speak to the social scientists, et cetera. So there is a deeply built in order of things that first comes the technological. And if there is repair work needed, then come the social sciences and they should convince and tell you how you can get your stuff into the households, convince the wonderful women who have all the power apparently in this society. <laughs> now, this has uh, come clearly across, I think. Eh? Uh, which is uh, obviously. And I wanted to draw your attention that big companies like Mercedes-Benz or any others, they have whole departments of social scientists and of humanities scholars to exactly manipulate whole societies. So I think the dichotomy is not about the technological and the social, but what is our common project? Do we want to have critical de technology developers? And do we want critical social scientists because it's not any social scientist and it's not any te technology developer we need. We need really different kind of minds. And I think that's, the, for me, the most important thing. And I would like to have your ideas about that. Thank you. Could you say something about what you are thinking about different kind of minds? Different kind of minds is that I do not start as a technology developer saying that the, I will bring the solution which is just a more a smarter technology. But right from the beginning think that my technology is only a little part of the puzzle and maybe be then less um, hubristic in the sense of thinking that the solution is necessarily a technological one. Maybe we travel in interesting ways too much. Maybe we think it's good to be everywhere. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it is the problem. And not to say, oh, I, I can, for example, Austrian Airlines, I book my flight and then they ask me seven euro if I want to compensate for my CO2 use. I find this is kind of unethical to the end to make me think that I can compensate by paying seven euros for flying across Europe. So I think this is an unethical way of being ethical. So, <laughs> so, so I, I, I'm just curious about that. So that's why I think I would like to see different minds in, in the technology. And I know people who kind of really engage in this. So it's not just a but I think really it's not the good social sciences that repair that and the bad technology. I don't think like that. I think we need different technological developers and we need new generation of people who think differently. Uh, thanks for, uh, for sharing your view. Um, and um, listening with, with my heart to your words, I first of all have a think of, I'd like to embrace you because you're, you're pointing exactly where it's all about. 
it's not like I have a technology and how can I sell this technology? Or the other way around, I know as uh, this is my ethical value and everyone should uh, behave according to these values. It should be an integration of the two of them. And the only way to, to get this done is at the end of the day, a different mindset. My, you're talking about, uh, what is it, 50 minutes ago, about truth. What is truth? If you talk about truth... At, you have to at, seven at, at, o'clock. Yeah, no, no, my point is, I'm, I'm as a physicist, I, I'm educated in a kind of physical truth. But I realized hey, physics and metaphysics is close to each other. So I realized in my second year that physics is nice, but it's only this part of. So I got the kind of education to see that physics is an element of a total. And my main message, which I don't, I did it at the TU Delft, so don't. But, but my main message was not uh, getting at the university directly, that I should align to other people. What are their things? What are their way of looking to reality, to, to environment? So I completely agree to your element. It's all about a different mindset. But how to get there is, first of all, start people working together. Sometimes clashes, sometimes seduction, sometimes building, uh, building together experiences, get enthusiastic, that kind of things. And sometimes, yeah, just failures, but then share the failures with each other and come because at the end of the day, people should have kind of experience that it's really attractive to work together. But then you go to more other things where you probably mo know much more about it from a philosophical or a psychological element. Then you talk about what are egos, how do you work with egos, how you get egos together. Well, anyway. There was a question from, from uh, there, and, and then I'll get to your question. Yeah, it's, it's related to, the, my name is Pankat Sakseria. I live in India, but I'm working at Maastricht University here in the Netherlands. And my question is related to the point that was just made. And it's a little more fundamental, I would think, is, and I've been kind of trying to understand the discussion that's going on. And uh, at some point, uh, one of you mentioned uh, development and the, the path to development and the need for development. So I, I'm just wondering whether there is uh, there's a possibility or a discussion on what development itself is. Because, for example, in the energy kind of context, uh, I'm, I, I'm also talking from an Indian perspective, growth in energy consumption is a non-negotiable. We don't discuss. Uh, so it's all about how do you produce more energy and sustainably and more environmentally friendly kind of energy. But the question of can we actually reduce energy consumption uh, is not there anywhere in the discourse at all. Because a windmill, perhaps, is a form of creating energy in a different kind of a way, which has all kinds of environmental and other implications, uh, which somehow get completely covered under. So the question of a more fundamental nature of whether we just should have, uh, in, in the case of energy, less energy consumption, and not look for ways of producing more energy in ways that are perceived to be more environment friendly. So is, is, is that, because then it's not a, te a technical or technological question at all. It's a far more fundamental question. And you, uh, you're, ask, you're actually asking who sets the agenda before we start innovating and ask the technicians that, for that, a solution. That, let's, that of, yes, let's that, be clear that, that about course, the problem. That the agenda is actually yeah. the, the second part of the, the, the question in that sense. Yeah. No. Uh, can we even ask that question whether we want, or should we have more energy, or should we be consuming more energy? which is not about agendas, and then how that more energy is created is the agenda, I, I, would, I would assume. Hmm. But yeah. No, I, I agree, and also with some of the critical remarks that have been made, um, uh, that you know, this, this responsible innovation seems to be open to the, to the criticism that yeah, you're starting with the technology, it's always geared towards what the engineers can come up with. I, I think that is, that is a, a slightly a misconception, because the, the, that's, that's why it's important to understand that we start from the grand challenges. It starts with, you know, what are our main problems? And then we'll see whether there are uh, clever technical solutions or socio-technical solutions or socio-techno-economical, cultural, psychological uh, solutions to solve that problem. But it's, it's, as I said in the beginning, there is no guarantee that there is such a silver bullet. It may just be the solution may be to change our way of behaving. That could well be. Often we find that we can 
And this is also why it's important to make a kind of a moral analysis uh, up front and to say, well, actually growth, what is the value, what is driving growth in economic growth in many cases is this that it's, it's prosperity, it's, it's to increase the well-being of people, to have more wealth, to distribute to people, to, to, to give them a better life, you know, or to give them more capabilities to talk in, in terms of SENS approach. Um, so this, these are jobs and employment and the betterment of lives of individual people is, is on the table. That's one thing. But it's also safety and security and privacy and sustainability on the table. So it's not a simple, we can of course pretend that it's a simple story and just focus on one of those values. No, of course we are obliged by all of those values and we just have to see um, whether we can come up with those clever solutions. If they're not there, we, we should give up on it and change and, and look for different, radically different uh, types of solutions. So that, that, that's, that's one thing I wanted to say. I want to also say something to your um, um, comment on the social science perspective, which we see a lot of it now. I mean, Cameron and many of the politicians have nudging teams. So there is, a, there is, a, there is an incredible advanced and rapidly expanding science of nudging, which is psychological social science, which is just, I mean, it's an advanced manipulation. And so it's, it's, it's used to manipulate large numbers of people into using this or moving in this direction or moving in that direction. This is why it's so incredibly important to have this critical resource um, like the humanities can offer. Um, um, that, that can help us to criticize what is happening over there or you know, what we are buying into if we buy into a certain type of products or a, t a particular type of infrastructure that comes with a whole, with a whole kit and caboodle. So um, this, is, this is crucial. Otherwise, we will be just off to a bad start. Yeah, um, you had a question there at the, the back. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is actually related to what Professor Fell just mentioned, the role of social scientists, how we want it to be, uh, as Professor van der Hoeven just uh, uh, summarized, but how it is right now, in reality, in uh, among many industries, is the way that Mr. Wagner just summarized, which is there is a technological development and there is a social scientist that makes that needs to just make sure that it is it is going to be accepted among the society. And this is exactly how different partners also in these kind of collaborations do refer to social scientists and humanities scholars. The phrase also mentioned today that when it comes to acceptance, you need the social sciences, we need you. That's exactly the kind of perception, the misguided perception, I do agree with you, the misguided perception that does exist. And it's actually a pretty strong image, a pretty strong misguided perception, which does affect our work because Many of us who have worked with, with industry partners have come across one way or the other that misguided perception that we are being considered as the one who is going to make it acceptable or who are going to tell them how to develop the technology that is accepted. Which is understandable from an industry perspective because in the end of, at the end of the day, that's their business. But this misguided perception, which is also very strong, is also affecting the way we are doing business and is also included in the way the financing me mechanism of these kind of approaches, the MW, MVI, the, the responsible innovation approaches of NWO are being based on. So my question would be, how do you think that we could come out of this impasse? How do you think that this, this stalemate could be over, uh, overcome, uh, uh, both among the partners who are doing this, the, the, the research, but also more broadly, societally speaking, the role of social scientists, uh, social scientists and humanists uh, in, in technological developments? Um, evolution and revolution. Um, revolution has a lot to do about uh, are there uh, what I would call tipping points where uh, people who are in charge of, of certain things in society realize I've made a really a big mistake by not using in the beginning um, people with your disciplines. For example, eh, uh, I don't want to make it bigger at the moment. If you see what's happening now in Groningen related to the, the gas discussions, people who I'm talking with, they realize we have made a really a big, big mistake. And that's a, what I would call kind of tipping point. But the other element of tipping point is that also you, you should uh, see these chances, chances and grab them. So at the moment, who of you is now talking to Hans Alders, for example? 
who is calling me, please, Hans, we invite you for a conversation because you are now at the moment in charge to get things solved in Groningen. And we have a, a different perspective and we are challenging you. That's the, tip, the typical, what I would call the element of, uh, of revolution. And there are a lot of tip, tipping points where you can see it. And the other thing is evolution. And that means, uh, she's now just leaving the, the room, but the element, what she was saying, uh, the element of uh, bridging, open the doors, go to others, no, and not being uh, sent away by, please make it acceptable, by saying, no, that's not why I'm in charge. I'm in charge of talking with you. What's the best way of working together to get different mindsets? And that's one of the balls which is in your room to get things changed. And then the evolution is just the element of having the same successful experience or failure experiences together. Then you're working together, get an understanding of each other. And one of the things, uh, in fact, we are doing in our responsibility is from the innovation point of view, uh, bringing with money or with inspiration or by setting agendas, people together uh, exactly on the same level that you are together working on uh, seeing what are the challenges and solving it together. Okay, thanks. Ah, this is boring or am I wrong? Uh? No, you're right. <laughs> um, I think I think we've we've come to the end of this. One yeah. last point. Okay, one last point, please. Yeah. But I think the, the fallacy in the discussion here is this, that on the one hand, you can presume beforehand what ex uh, acceptability en uh, entails, and that was what, what Ben was talking about, right? We already know what we think is acceptable, and then social scientists should be brought in to ensure that that will be the case. But you can also, uh, in the process, uh, make part of the process, reflect on what acceptability entails for a specific uh, innovation, and then the role of social scientists becomes much broader and critical. Okay, okay thanks for, for that last remark. I think we should... I'm sorry? No, no question. Do you have a question? Fine. Yeah. Perhaps I'm allowed to ask one uh, last question, because you said, well, uh, within the STEM program of the Top Sector Energy, we started just with a lot of projects. Within the MVI program, which we are running since 2009, we have about 50 new uh, research project. So yesterday we presented the 17 that have been uh, granted uh, this year. Uh, so this seems to be a quite successful uh, yeah, start, or uh, uh, it's not mainstream yet. But my, my question is, uh, this is all happening at NWO, this is all happening within the top sector energy. You just said, well, I'm talking about uh, with the other top sectors, but what is the strategy to bring this one step further? And one step further is perhaps uh, yeah, uh, bringing this to the government or to bringing this at the European level so that they also uh, yeah, feel yeah, this is very important for us to, yeah, to uh, uh, innovate in a responsible way. Can you reflect a little bit on, uh, on, this, uh, on this question? Well, I can give you an example, a um, very practical, concrete example. Um, I've recently been asked to chair a committee by the Ministry, uh, Minister of Economic Affairs on privacy and big data. Um, and that's, that's of course, an, an incredible, um, uh, large and difficult topic. Um, but actually, in discussing this with the, um, the civil servants that are supporting that and with the staff of the minister, we, we came in a natural way to think of this, you know, a, a, a responsible innovation line where we can, we would like to utilize all the knowledge and wisdom and, and information that, that big data can help us to, to get a better understanding of how society works and um, also to help us solve some of the, the large problems. But of course, without the privacy uh, and security uh, drawbacks. Uh, so use the functionality because we have more or less, we're under a moral obligation to do a better job in, in solving crimes and, 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 and um, crowd control and all of these things. Um, but without these, these privacy problems, um, same with the smart meter, you know, the functionality of the smart meter without the privacy drawbacks. So come up with a smart design. Um, and, and that is not a, simply a cryptographic solution. That is also a, as we know, security is to a large extent about the data governance and the incentive structures of, you know, that you put in place, the laws and, and regulation that you put in place, the, the self-regulation mechanisms that, that, that IT industry adopts. So that is a whole package, a socio-technical system uh, of enormous proportions. But we need to think about the design of that or else we will be, you know, um, 
struggling for a long for a long time with this problem. So this is an example of how how you could bring this to the level of policymakers and politicians that will then will see the potential of this idea uh, because it's a straightforward and, and simple idea. The other thing is is that just to um, see how it will um, be picked up outside of Europe, and we already have a good good. Um, um, evidence that that people outside of Europe, uh, we, we're, we're dealing with a, a consortium of eight technical universities in China, for example, um, and Tsinghua, one of the biggest universities, um, most important universities in China is among them, how they can incorporate this idea of responsible innovation in the curriculum for applied scientists and engineers in China. We're talking about millions and millions of engineering students being educated uh, along these lines, this is this is, uh, and they're just explicitly uh, referencing this this MVI or this responsible innovation idea. So that I think that that in itself, in and by itself, is a, is a huge success, and and uh, I think we will see more of that in the in the in the near future. Uh, Jasper, I think there are a lot of opportunities, but um, based on my uh, journalist uh, leading this uh, discussion from history. How is finance coming from a staff department to the board? How is quality coming from a staff department to the board? How is uh, societal, uh, responsible societal behavior coming to the board? There are a lot of different ways to get this done. And there are special roles for NGOs. There are special roles for uh, politicians. Um, and one of the things which I like what we are now doing is we started with a group like you telling the story and everyone should pick it up. Kijk, from my point of view as an NGO, that I'm going to the other role, is um, very practical. There is an, um, an, a business uh, argument or a business instrument, uh, I would say, by purchasing. If you build infrastructure, you can get a maximum of 10% discount on your, uh, your bid if you are doing the right thing from a sustainable point of view. One of the elements in this criteria is that you should have at minimum two times a year a discussion with critical NGOs about your sustainable behavior and your sustainable initiatives, your sustainable innovation program. That means at the end of the day that, that it's also the responsibility of, of, my, of myself and my colleagues to have a certain level of being very critical. That's an element. So you see a direct relation to business, because if you don't do this kind of things, you miss 2% of the 10% discount, if you do these kind of things. And of course, what we are saying, we are not having a kind of secret discussions in boardrooms. No, you should make it public what's discussed. One element. I can tell a lot of different elements where you see all these kind of things. Please spread the news by doing it. Thank you very much. Th those are our great last words, I think. Thanks, everybody, for being here uh, over the last two days. And um, I hope you'll be seeing each other again uh, somewhere next year. And um, there'll be drinks downstairs. And, um, well, thank you all very much. Have fun.